Getting ready to get started, I want to introduce the candidates, Philip, Dr. Philip Swanson, Dr. Deanna McClendon, and Mr. Robert Hooper. We are going to give them a five minute time limit to come in to do their introductory speech. And then we will ask for questions from you all. And if Doris has not looked at your question, she must look at it before you ask it. And on the questions, you are going to get a three minute time limit. So at three minutes, the buzzer will go off. You'll have about 30 seconds to wrap it up. This forum will be done at 8.30 tonight. So I just want to let everyone know, and we want to try to do it as quickly and as nicely as we can, and we all want to be very professional about it. So we are fixing to get started, and I guess we will ask Dr. Philip Swanson to uh, give us uh, his introduction. Hello, everyone. It's great to see such a large crowd here interested in the future of Monroe County education. And I thank all those out here for, uh, who are supporting me and supporting our other candidates tonight. And I think all of us will work and do, do our very best, depending upon who is selected down the road. <clears throat> I was born in Coca Creek um, to Leo and Merrill Swanson. Um, my, my brother, Roger Swanson's here tonight, my other brother, Chop Swanson, my sister, Alda Roberts, and my wife, Leandra Swanson, are here, as well as my children, Savannah Swanson, Thomas Spradlin, and Leah Spradlin. I'm really appreciative of the support that they provide for me in this, and I thank you for that. Like I said, I was raised in Coca Creek. Um, to in a uh, situation that we, my father had a heart attack when I was eight years old and he never worked again. And my mother worked in a sewing factory and times were pretty hard uh, as we grew up. But we never lacked for love of each other and the family. And my parents, although only educated through the eighth grade, they epitomized lifelong learners. Many of you may have known Leo Swanson or Merrill Swanson and know the type of people they were. And I hope that I've come to be the type of man they would have hoped they raised. After I left Coca Creek, I went to Teleco High School. I um, have great pride in being a graduate of Teleco High School. I played uh, all three sports at that time, baseball, football, and basketball. Uh, I graduated in the top 10 there. Um, I was selected as most athletic, best personality, and best all-around student at graduation. And I took a great deal of pride in that. After I left Teleco High School, I went to Hiawassee, where I played baseball. I was named most valuable player as a freshman there and led the team in hitting. And eventually, I went to Tennessee Wesleyan and played there as well. After getting out of Tennessee Wesleyan, I went one year to Meigs County. And Ted Belcher, the uh, superintendent of Monroe County, called me because they had an opening here in English and in the basketball program. And so I came at uh, Mr. Belcher's request to be uh, here at Madisonville High School at that time. Served there for uh, five years, at which point I went back to Teleco High School and uh, taught English there and eventually became the principal at Teleco High School. I then had a chance to go to McMinn County High School where Dr. Fogarty had just become the director of schools and I served for seven years at McMinn High as assistant principal and that gave me an opportunity to mature, to uh, learn valuable lessons under good administrators and be prepared for the next uh, uh, principal's job which was a McMahon County Vocational School where I served for four years. After that, Dr. Fogarty saw fit to um, allow me to become 
the secondary supervisor of instruction. I served there under Dr. Ford. I learned a great deal and had a lot of roles there, including chief negotiator. I was on the policy committee, the, center, uh, the uh, system-wide policy committee for 17 years and several other assignments. Eventually, I was the testing coordinator there, the system-wide testing coordinator. Uh, and I've done a lot of things through that uh, assignment that I'll probably get to later. So a couple of years ago, I made the decision to retire, and I did. And I've had a good two years. I've enjoyed my two years. I, some people call me the bug doctor. Right, Tracy? <laughs> and um, so um, I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed uh, getting to know a lot of people in this county again and ha have just really enjoyed my retirement. And I think there was one job that would have hastened me out of retirement, and that is the director of schools of Monroe County. I believe I can help the school system in Monroe County. I've been encouraged by many people who believe I can help the school system. So that's why I'm here before you today, and I thank you for this opportunity. Good evening, I'm Deanna McClendon, and let's get it all the way out in the open, right off the top. Everybody wants to know, is it true what's been going on in the news. And so I want to just say two things I know are very true. I've not done anything that I shouldn't have done. Uh, it is just a process in the district where I currently am employed to make sure that if anyone writes any sort of a letter that we do our due diligence to investigate. Young children are involved and you need to always, I'm going to always make sure uh, and support that we stand up for children. And the second thing I know for sure is if you go to the Chinese buffet in Madisonville and it says frog legs, it's probably frog legs. So those are the two things that I really know. Uh, just to tell you just a little bit about me, I am from Monroe County. I am a Monroe Countyan. I actually uh, went K through 12 here in Madisonville, Tennessee. As a matter of fact, Dr. Swanson was one of my high school English teachers. And so my parents both have been here. My father, Alfred McClendon, he's still living. Uh, and he is still here, and my mother, LaFrancis McClendon, she uh, passed on in November. And so both of them really taught us that you have to have a servant leader spirit. Uh, and they have exemplified that in this community, and they have passed that on to me. And so I left Madisonville, and I went to college over in Jackson. Uh, I began my career working, teaching second and third grade, and looping at uh, Metro Nashville schools. Uh, I was a best on-camera participant for reading instruction, and I began then to really look at what are curriculum strategies and ideas, and I did graduate with my master's from MTSU. I went on to work in Shelby County Schools. I started there teaching just in middle school, and it seemed like every time I would be making traction, I would work myself right into my next position. And so they wanted someone to take the district in a different direction as far as reading was concerned. And so I went to the central office to be what I thought was the reading supervisor. Well, it became that I was the uh, language arts, I was the reading supervisor, I had foreign language, and I had fine arts and anything else that they could put in my office on my desk when I was out of the office. And so I worked at that for about four or five years, and then the lady who was my director at that particular time decided she was sort of tired of central office, and she said, uh, Doc, I think you need to take this position. You're ready, you've been supporting it, you've been helping me do all this work, and I think I'm gonna go back out to a school. And so I then did become the director of early childhood and elementary programs for what I thought was a small district. But at that time, we had about 31 elementary schools. And I became the director of elementary and early childhood programs there. We had a merger back in 2013, uh, one of the largest mergers in public school history. And at that particular time, we reorged and they said, look, we need somebody to take our early childhood programs in a new direction. 
and they said we think you're the person for that job and so I came on then and I think I had a budget of about seven million dollars we had about a hundred classrooms I'm excited and happy to say six years later we have a 50 million dollar division we have almost 300 classrooms in that division and we handle everything in that division from buses from nutrition to instruction to professional development and so it is almost similar in that you're running a school district for three and four year olds uh, I think I got a good question the other night someone said Dr. McClendon you seem very well versed in the early years and maybe middle school what about high school and I had to remind him that I had worked with little Johnny but I had also worked with big Johnny in working with those fine arts foreign language and those principles in making sure that we actually had pre-k classrooms in their school as well as making sure their teachers were qualified everything was up to code and that we had attendance and graduation rates and so all of that leads me uh, to here tonight the reason I'm so interested in this particular position is my father is still here in this community and as you age to whom much is given much is required and I know that I need to come home and support my father who is here by himself now I think this is a great opportunity to be from Madisonville and be able to come back and use all the strategies that I've learned somewhere else and be able to provide those for the families and the students here in Monroe County thank you Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Hooper, a lifelong citizen of Monroe County. And to understand me, as I talked about in my interview, you have to understand my family because they have influenced me so much and taught me so many things. So I happen to have my family here with me tonight. So guys, I'm gonna embarrass you and ask you to stand up. So go ahead and stand up as we work our way through this and I'll tell you a little bit about the influences there. My oldest daughter is standing on the front. For a time in our life, about 10 years ago, we had a blind autistic family member that came to live with us. Mary took such a huge interest when Corbin came to stay with us during that time period. She made sure he was an older child, but she made sure that he was potty trained and a lot of other things went on Corbin during that time. I knew Mary was going to make an ideal special ed teacher at such an early age watching her during that experience. She's in her second year as a special ed teacher at Madisonville Primary. She's also working on a graduate degree at this time. Hank, her husband, is standing there with, with him. He has two jobs going on right now. Hank is finishing a, 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 a program at McGee T Tyson Airport where he's going through some training and he works for the Chattanooga City Fire Department. Can you today? We'll let you. My wife standing there beside us, my wife Ann of 32 years. We were allowed to do something very special here in Monroe County. During our third year of teaching, I think it was, we were allowed to both teach at Ruleville Elementary School where we taught there together for 15 years. It was an exceptional time for us there being at Royal Vale because we, we had a third team mem member that worked with us, Tracy Freeman. We were PLCing before PLC was worked, doing all types of things. The school had an incredible bargain with all three of us because we spent countless hours working together, preparing classes, doing all kinds of extra things. My 15 years at Royal Vale were amazing. Okay, I'll let you. <laughs> My middle daughter, uh, Maisie, that's here with us. Maisie was able to get an exceptional amount of training at Teleco High School in the area of math and science. I cannot thank those teachers enough for the training that was provided to her during that time. And that has helped her. Maisie will start her third year working on BSR in this fall. I think a lot of it has to do with the good background in math and science she was able to get at Teleco High School. Her husband Jeremy is standing there beside her. Jeremy works at Havco three years. I don't think he's missed today yet, 
but Jeremy has influenced me a lot with my ideas that I have on CTE and how important that is. I feel like there's probably in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent of our boys in high school now, they're not going to go to college. And we have got to make sure that CTE program is really providing them with good training so they come out of there and can find something. All right, you two guys can sit down. My final daughter, who told me after my interview when I got home, she said, uh, Dad, you realize you went on and on and on about the other two girls, and the only thing you said about me is that uh, she's a pretty good student and she plays basketball. <laughs> Maggie is an exceptionally good student. She had very good grades this year, very dedicated to basketball. I think she finished probably her last camp this morning. She's been up by 6.30 each day off to basketball. So there you go, Maggie. <laughs> I began my teaching here in Monroe County in 1987. I was so excited. I showed up here for uh, in-service training, the building where we began our training at doesn't even exist anymore. So I show up in there and you know how you are on that first year, you're just so thankful you've got a job. So I show up and Dale Toomey was the principal there and this has affects my ideas on things too and I said by the way Dale, you know I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to go to today in service was handled a little bit differently then. What am I going to be teaching? He said oh you're going to be teaching kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. I was at Ball Play Elementary School. There were only four of us teachers there that year at that very tiny little school. And Mr. Toomey also left out, you're going to have four special needs students, and the special ed teacher only comes on Fridays for one hour. I was broken in really good my first year of teaching and that affected a, lo a lot of things about what I think about education and how things should work. It was, you know, we got through it, but it was not the easiest year. And then after that, I left ball play and made my way to Rural Vale where I talked about with Ann that ended up being one of the most positive experiences because of the team of people that I worked with and that affects my ideas on teamwork which I think are critical. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call your name and you're going to come up. I'll give you your questions and if you would ask the candidates using this mic, that would be good. So Dave Evans. <clears throat> Dave said he forgot his glasses, so. <laughs> He's got it memorized. Thank you all for having this. Uh, and thanks to the candidates for uh, being interested in the kids of, of Monroe County. I've got a big voice, so people won't have any trouble hearing me. Uh, my question is uh, in two parts. And the first one is that you know that Monroe County seemingly always has budget issues and that there's always a directive toward the director of schools to make some, some adjustments in his budget. And this year we've heard and that there are several opinions about which way that uh, the director of schools, the school board, and the county commission should go. And one of those is that they want to ask teachers to pay more for their insurance. Now, I've taught Monroe County 30 years, and part of that time, uh, or all that time, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have good insurance. And I know that good insurance for your teachers is a selling point in terms of, your uh, in terms of the county in recruiting teachers and keeping them. And I've heard some estimates that it would cost each teacher, if that were to happen, about $200 plus each month, you know, would be taken out of their paycheck so that they could pay a larger share of their insurance. And the other thing was that uh, knowing that 
first part of this question is I want you to direct your answers toward the teachers of Monroe County and tell them what you think that you can do to make that insurance stay in place so that we can be competitive in our teacher recruitment. That's the first part. The second part is that we have two buildings that are in dire need of just probably being replaced. And of course that's Madisonville Middle School and Teleco Plains Junior High School. And I know, as I was a board member at one time, and I know that we had a five-year plan. And at that time, it was to replace you know, those two schools, to build new schools. And the teachers who are there know the problems that those buildings have. And the maintenance department knows how much effort they have just to keep those buildings safe. And so I want you to address the fact that at some point in time we are going to have to have new schools and new buildings and how do you propose to present that along with the board you know to pay for those buildings and I'll sit down and listen to your answers thank you so much thank you Dave that's great can you hear me yeah thank you Dave that's a great question um, the vast uh, majority of the experience I've had in budgeting came under Dr. John Forty uh, when I was in the central office in McMahon County. I was the chief negotiator and a big part of that was working, uh, a, a big component of that was working in the budget because uh, as you formulate a budget obviously uh, teacher salaries and insurance are a big part of that. I recall when I went to McMinn County in 1992, I worked with, uh, I don't know if Alicia Connolly's here tonight or not, but she taught art at McMinn County High School. And I think we worked together close to 10 years, Alicia, I'm not sure, but uh, I remember she said, I'm, I'm going to, back to Monroe County, and I said, how can you afford that? Um, you, you, you'll take a big pay cut. She said, no. When you factor in the family health plan, it's uh, actually I'll be making a little more, especially when you calculate in the, um, the travel. Well, uh, I, when I was still in Monroe County, I'm not sure exactly the year, but in lieu of a raise one year, the teachers elected to get the family health insurance plan that they have in place now. I noted the other night, Thursday, this board adopted the memorandum of understanding in which that insurance plan is in place. I consider the memorandum of understanding a covenant with the teachers. And I understand the budget, um, the budget is, um, it's been a tough thing, and I think July 10th is the next budget workshop, so it looks like it'll fall to the next person. Um, the uh, ability to balance that budget is not only desired, it's required. So I know there will be some hard lessons uh, that would be taken, but since the board adopted the Memorandum of Understanding Thursday night, cutting into that insurance plan could not be a consideration for me. Now. Then you get into, well, where are you going to balance the budget? Well, there's been a lot of discussion. You all have heard that. And the um, insurance is a piece of it. The salaries are a piece of it. The uh, state sent down 2% to, to go to salaries and not to get too complicated. But when the state average salary index is below the state average, you can't funnel money into fringe benefit. It's got to go into the salaries. So that's what has to happen. Now, how we're going to balance the budget, we'll have to figure that out. And is that, am I out of time? I didn't know there was time limit on each answer. Three minutes. Three minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. I've got more to say. I'll try to get it in later. I've got, yes, I want to talk to that because I think it says something. Um, another wisdom I picked up from Dr. Forty was the five-year plan. 
and he always in terms of the facilities there was a plan if if someone wanted something then they got in the back of the line on the fifth year and that was how the things were prioritized we were talking about teleco plains high school that used to be Telco Plains High School and Massville High School. And you remember those gyms fell in within hours of each other. I think it's 68, 69, somewhere back then. But those schools um, are in disrepair now. And so you, you have a need. I have shocked people when I told them, people who are familiar with Central High School, I have shocked them when I told them that Mint Men Central High School is older than Massville Middle and Teleco Plains Junior High. It is an older building. I think that speaks to your maintenance and care for what you have. We have to take good care of what we have. You do that in your homes, schools are no different. So the caring for the facilities has to be a priority for all our buildings and including those two. I also saw in the five-year plan by June of 2018 or 19 there would be a plan in place for these schools and it's June of 2019. So um, that'll be another thing that'll file to the next director of schools. So thank you. So before I start with the question, I wanna first just congratulate Teleco Plains Junior High. He brought that up. And I understand that they, their beta club, uh, won the championship for people of living literature. And so I want to make sure that we're recognizing those students who performed well over at the state level uh, concerning that matter. So when we think through insurance, I'm excited to death. Uh, to maybe hopefully become an employee of Monroe County Schools because it's unheard of that you pay a hundred percent of an individual's insurance and that you pay 85 percent on the family plan. That is like a huge win for the teachers and the employees here and hopefully as a future employee I would say that needs to stay. Uh, emphatically I would support that that it does need to absolutely stay. One of the things that you're thinking through in the budget, and he says, what about these two schools who we know that there was a plan maybe to replace? You've got to get down with your budget and your budget center managers. And I think you've got to go through and make a plan for everything that you have to have in that budget. And then you've got to look at your goals and your priorities and say, these are our goals and our priorities, and so we're going to use our resources or our funding to address those particular goals and those priorities. When you think about the management, and one of the things that we did, we put in 51 playgrounds, and playgrounds cost about ten dollars to $15,000. In the last five years, we've put in 51. So I know that you have to look at your budget, You've got to pay for what you have to pay for. Then you've got to say playgrounds, new buildings, uh, maintenance are things that have to go at the top of the list right along with academics and professional development. And then you start a plan. This is what we're going to do in phase one. This is what we'll do in phase two. And this is what we'll do in phase three. And through that particular planning, you are able to address those things. I don't know that we stop there. I think uh, whoever is in this particular position would need to build a bridge with the county commission and with the board and go in and have a conversation. Hey, we've looked at our budget. Let's be transparent. These are the things that we've seen. We've worked hard to cut out any waste that's in our budget. What could you do to help us now that we've gone back and we've done our due diligence to make sure we're being good stewards of the money? And so I think that's the second part uh, of making sure that you are addressing uh, the needs of that budget. I'm going to take the second part of that question first because in thinking about the buildings, a number that we don't talk about much kind of worries me. There is $52 million of debt that already exists in Monroe County. It's my understanding on buildings. I don't know how that money is being paid for, how that debt has been structured, if we're taking care of the principal on that. The first step in looking into our buildings is to look as just like you would do a project with your own home, 
Look at the debt that you have now, make sure it's structured carefully, and you've got a plan that's attacking that principal, so you're knocking that out of the way. Because the thoughts of running that $52 million to $100 million, you know, where, where do we stop? So we have, that has to be looked at first. Now, one of those two buildings is directly behind the building that I currently am principal at. I go over there quite often and talk with Ms. Hunt and tour the building. I know firsthand how badly some new things need to be done there. So a plan of action, like was mentioned, we've got to tackle the debt. Then we begin to look at how we can put these two new buildings into place. We do not live in a high income area where the people here can afford to continue to raise and raise and raise and raise taxes. We've got to very carefully look at what we have to work with and figure out what we can afford. You know, I think about my two elderly parents and they have a very small home, but continuing to add to what they have to pay. That's kind of hard for me to ask them, you know, so I see, I told you the fa my family affects, and I think my family represents Monroe County quite a bit. The other part of that, the insurance that Dave Evans mentioned, that is an amazing benefit. And that allows teachers here, when they do get their 30 years in, to truly have the choice to retire. Whereas in other places, you don't have, if you don't have that insurance in place, really that choice of retiring is not available to you because the cost of that insurance is so exorbitant. We do not want to take that away from teachers because sometimes after 30, 31, 32 years of chasing after kindergartners, you become tired. It's a hard job and it wears you out. So I would hate to see that option go, go away from teachers. I do worry about how sust sustainable it will be for our incoming teachers that we have, but every effort needs to be made possible to keep that, that into place. Early on in my teaching, that I'm out of time, sorry. This is Ron Cox. He has a question for all board, all members, or all candidates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hooper, Dr. McClendon, and Dr. Swanson. What would be your plans for expanding EPSOs for our high school students? They didn't hear it. What would be your plans for expanding EPSOs for our high school students? Go ahead. Thank you. First ever time. Hope that means something. <laughs> I know a lot about early post-secondary opportunities. Um, that's the new component that the state moved in a couple of years ago, and I, I referenced it in an earlier interview in regards to making a rigorous curriculum where our uh, students can excel both in the high schools and earlier, but the early post-secondary opportunities is programmed around the high school and the departure from our three high schools. One of those early post-secondary opportunities is dual credit. There are some um, uh, offerings that you can actually test and obtain credit for the entry into the, the, the CCAT, uh, the TCATs, or into uh, other uh, technical areas. Another example is dual enrollment. Dual enrollment, most of you are pretty familiar with. It would be like a student in senior high school senior English and taking a dual enrollment offering that they simultaneously get credit for the college cur curriculum and the high school curriculum. Another one that I don't think has been uh, uh, capitalized on as much as I would like to see it has to do with the advanced placement offerings. 
uh, when I was in McMinn County, I was able to, during my course of secondary uh, supervisor of instruction, I was able to, uh, when I first started, we struggled to have one dual enrollment offering just in senior English. By the time I le left, there was a plethora of offerings. Uh, we have many AP offerings, we have many dual enrollment offerings. Uh, an, a an advanced placement offering on a college transcript is very advantageous, especially to get into elite institutions like Duke, Harvard, and some of those places. I think it helps several of our students in McMinn County get into the service academies like uh, West Point and uh, the Naval Academy and such. So I think it's important on those early post-secondary opportunities for our students. A byproduct to that and related, and it, I think unless things have changed, it's new here, but it's the opportunity for eighth graders to take high school content. If you allow eighth graders to take high school content, it frees up more offerings later in their high school career to get into more rigorous offerings to enhance their transcripts. So not only is it advantageous to the students themselves, but it's also a, a positive reflection on the school system. So thank you. So I'm glad you asked that question because one of the things that uh, we're doing that I would think would be very advantageous to the students, the high school students in Monroe County, students coming in as freshmen actually almost should look at it as a college courses. And so what we would do is each student that comes in as a freshman should have what we call a four-year plan with what we think of as a major and a minor. And what that means is if I am a freshman student and I think that I have some interest in health occupation, I need to set out my four-year plan so that I'm going to be able to take some dual, en dual enrollment credit courses or some advanced placement courses by the time I get to my junior and senior year. So that might be my major. My minor might be percussion because I might be a band student and so I want to make sure that I'm spending a great deal of time with that. And so one of the things in looking at students coming in and deciding on I'm going to have my four year plan with a major and a minor, you can take them through dual credit. We need to be looking at each of our CTE courses to make sure that those particular courses are actually leading to a certificate. It's not enough for you to matriculate through if when you get to the end of auto mechanics or you get to the end of some of those other courses if you don't actually have a certificate. I'd like to lead those students right up to the door where they're able to take their state assessment, they're able to go into work using that certificate. Uh, I think that's something we need to look at because a good deal diesel mechanic makes, starts out making about $50,000. And so we need to make sure that our children who are participating in those courses are coming out. We think through the other piece of that is eighth grade and seventh grade. So we have students that are smart enough that even in the seventh grade year they should be taking pre-algebra so that their eighth grade year they can take algebra and foreign language and then that leads them room as they matriculate through high school to take those upper level courses and go into their first year of college having probably almost a semester worth of college credit. And I think we have lots of students here in Monroe County who are, would be able to take advantage of that program. I think that we need to make sure we're building good relationships with uh, neighboring institutions like Cleveland State, uh, Maryville College, and others to see what kind of relationship could we build so that we are making sure that we are having our students have those opportunities. And I think something else that you have to think through, what about our students who maybe uh, have missed the mark, who are on the cusp of maybe dropping out? Because sometimes we have a tendency to pay attention to our best and our brightest, but we forget that there are some other lights that need an opportunity to be turned on as well. And so there need to be some options as well for those students as far as support and GED uh, programs and course recovery and those types of programs as well. They need an opportunity with those. Thank you. I had a conversation at the end of last week with a gentleman and we were talking about CTE courses. He said, do you know Steve Harris? 
And I said, I sure do know Steve Harris that teaches at Sequoia High School. I had both of his daughters in my classroom as I went through Ruleville Elementary. And he began to tell me about Steve's welding program that he does here at Sequoia High School and how those students are able to, once they have finished that here, then the welding opportunities that they're able to find really good jobs to make good money through hopefully a certification program. We have got to make sure that that same level of quality is available at all three schools and all of our CTE programs that as they go through them, there is certification where if they want to go into the employment level, they will be able to do that. Or if that certification allows them to maybe go from, say, LPN to a RN transition type program. That's, that's where we start. The second part of that, it was mentioned about uh, high school courses being taught at the junior high level. During my time at Rural Vale, I taught Algebra I for a number of years, for as long as they would allow us to do Algebra I. So I generally had a group of students, I tried to always get at least 10, that I was able to divide my time with and do an Algebra I course there at Rural Vale. And that enabled them to go to the high school and then take other upper level math courses. Now when they took that, stopped doing that, I felt like that was a huge mistake because those, those kids were able to move right along in their math training. The hard part of that is though, when you're doing those like Algebra 1 at the middle school level, at the end of the year that child's going to take the same TN ready test in math. So my, the students that I worked with took it pretty good but I would, I would make sure that I put them through the same test prep as my other regular ed math kids and getting them ready for that. So you, you've got to think about making sure you wouldn't want the kids to end up with some bad TN ready scores because they were working on algebra. So you've got to keep that going as well. Dual enrollments classes, there is not a better bargain available. Both of my two daughters took as many dual enrollment courses as they were allowed to take. The advantage of going in as a freshman and not having such a high load of classes on your first years is excellent. So that has to absolutely be continued as it's done. But the big thing again, I think we can improve on because I see a huge percent of our boys that are not going to go to college is improving our CTE. Ezra Plemons. Molly's coming to the front. Uh, the next candidate to be first to talk will be Dr. McClendon. We'll let her go first the next time. <laughs> My question is for all three candidates. No one can deny the impact a positive work environment has on the success of a school. As director, what would be your role in helping to maintain or create positive work environments at both the central office and school levels? So frequently we say uh, we need to make sure that we do what is best for children. I think that you forget that you must do what is best for children and families, but you also must do what is best for the employees. Because lots of times on a child's uh, day, a teacher's worst day, that is the child's best hope. So one of the things I think is there has to be a transparency. Uh, you know, I've not been here, and so I only know what I've read in the paper. I only know what I hear in board meetings about the way that we do things. I think that I have heard over and over again as I call members of the community that we have staff at the central office who are phenomenal. They need an opportunity to have some support and direction on the direction they need to go. I have heard over and over again, we've got great teachers in schools and great administrators in schools, and they just need some support. I think one thing that might be a little bit different about me is I have some strategies that I think I'd like to bring in. So one of the things as I talked to community members, they said, there are jobs and we never really know how people are appointed or they get the jobs. 
Uh, and they said, I have a real problem with that. I heard that over and over again in my interviews with community members. And I think that we need to go to a transparent situation. Jobs should be posted. I think there should be a committee at the school made up of the administrative team. There should be a teacher on that team. There should be a community member or parent or PTO president that is a part of that interview team. And that way I think that people could be interviewed. It could be a fair process. There should be a rubric. There should be scores. And then everyone can feel good about the transparency of that particular process. I think that raises self-esteem. Something that when I was calling around to the community members and talking to teachers and even students, they said, we never are recognized for anything from the central office. Nobody recognizes us. Our principal does a great job of recognizing us frequently, but I never hear from the central office. And I said, well, is there something as simple as if you got a call from me on your birthday, or if you got a birthday card from the central office, would that make a difference? They said, absolutely. I said, well, there are only 321 teachers here. I think someone could give you a call for your birthday or send a card. They said, Dr. McClendon, I'd be happy if they just sent me a ream of paper. <laughs> So I think that what you have to do is really listen, and that's what I tried to do on my, all my calls, was to really listen to see what is it that teachers want. Frequently, we think esteem is tied to monetary. Most of us did not go into education because we thought we were going to get rich. We had a passion. We cared about children. There were things that made us go into education. And so I think we need to ask the teachers and the faculty at Central Office and really listen to what, they, what it is they want that would make them feel good about getting up and giving their best on their worst day to those children. It might go a little faster if we held our applause till the end, maybe. Because <laughs> we still have a lot of questions. I, I think to make a, an environment positive, and I feel like at Teleco Elementary, where I've been for the last 15 years, you'll find it to be one of the most positive environments around. But what what you have to do to have a really positive environment is teamwork. Now you, you build teams at all, all different levels. Now when I first went there, I rearranged people and I rearranged people. Some of it, I, I saw, you know, you take the people you have and you try to put them where they can do the best job possible and serve the students in the best way possible. And that's what I did. I shifted and changed, shifted and changed, till I got to a spot where I felt really good about where everyone was. Now, in part of that shifting and changing that I did with the teachers there, I looked too to make sure I was building compatible teams at each grade level where I was getting groups of people together that truly enjoyed working together. So when they're staying Tuesday afternoon for an hour on a PLC, it's a comfortable, nice environment, and they're going to enjoy sitting there talking, figuring out what to do with their students. Now, when you have those grade level teams going really good, then you've got to have cross teams. When you have cross teams at your, at your place, you have all sorts of different opportunities for leadership in your school. It might be being in charge of a Veterans Day program. It might be the person in charge of your faculty dinner. You know, all those different things. So you build cross teams with that. You take a few people from each of those different grade levels and you build different teams. Same thing for a data team. You try to then get people from all the different grade levels to work with your data team. And pretty soon, you've got your grade level teams working together and then you've got cross level teams working together and everybody's working out really good, and I think we've managed to accomplish that at Teleco Elementary. Now, toward the end of the school, on our last staff development day, Shauna Bowers is our elementary supervisor, and Shauna is huge into teamwork, and I really like that about Shauna. She wanted the Madisonville primary second grade teachers to come and meet with our second grade teachers and to basically work on text prep. What are you going to do? How are you going to get ready? What, 
what are go you're going to be your practice activities. Well, those two groups of ladies from both schools came together and they ended up having a great day working and talking. And I'm sure they talked about way more than test prep, but they ended up with some very positive relationships after that day. So countywide, we've got to continue to build opportunities for positive for teamwork. Sonia Harden. No, you can't. Oh, it shut me down. <laughs> Sorry. Ez, thank you for that question. I've known Ezra a long time, and I think that is a big question and a big priority for me is, is this school system raising the level of morale because you have a reason to be proud of your efforts and what you do. I, I feel like sometimes, I've said this before on our accountability model, there's a thousand ways to fail. And when you're successful, you got to celebrate successes, not ignoring where you fall short, but not let that dictate the narrative when overall you've done well. And I say to the Monroe County teachers and administrators, uh, paraprofessionals, y'all are doing a good job. I educated my kids in this school system. I believe in what we're doing in this school system. Now, how do you accomplish that? Well, Ed, the first thing I would believe in is being a truth teller and building trust. And I don't, um, I don't know how you operate if people can't depend on what you say. Now, sometimes you may not respond at that moment because you always know, and I've learned, this 27 years of school administration, that what this one says may be countered later by this one. But I think it's important to listen to all. And when you make a decision, it's a decision and not a consideration. So I, that would be a big priority for me is earning, earning the trust of the employees of this county and the school board. Uh, I believe being positive is better than being negative. Um, you know, I didn't bring any suckers tonight, but I believe that Teachers respond to notes, as she alluded to, and they respond to a good pat on the back and a job well done comment. That doesn't cost anything. And I believe if, if uh, we convey that, and I would convey that to the central office, I would convey that to our administrators, our teachers need to feel encouraged and supported, uh, both emotionally and also in terms of providing what they need. Um, uh, uh, the celebrations I've mentioned, I, you know, I've worked alongside many of y'all. Many of you I actually had in class years ago, and I just believe in what you do. I've seen your work from outside the system. I think I can bring some ideals back to this system, and I know that I can support and help the teachers and administrators grow. And another thing I would say, you know, you get asked a lot of questions, but um, I would just say, I'd play with the team I inherit. Now, we're going to go to work and try to get better, and I'm going to try to help on that, but I'll play with the team we inherited, and whatever changes need to be made, I'll make them subsequent as I get informed to the changes that will be needed, because I'm sure there will be some. But uh, I thank you for all that you do for these students. This question is for all three candidates. There's been some discussion on contracting custodial care and possibly maintenance, and I'd like to know how you personally feel about that. If you saw the newspaper at the beginning of last year, there was a picture of my custodian, Karen Hamilton, standing out front helping a child out of a car door. Now, Miss Karen is much more to our school than the lady that just sweeps the floor and picks up the garbage. She cares as much for the kids as any teacher in that building. And it is really important to me to have a staff of people there at our school that I know that I'm used to seeing every day 
that care about the school and our kids, I th some of those kids would miss Miss Karen more than they would me if when they got out of the car in the morning. So I do not think that that is a good idea to start contracting out those jobs. The kids in our school need to know and respect the, the persons in those jobs and they are also a role model for the kids that they see every day. I had the chance today to ran into an old friend, uh, Stanley Harris, who's working now in the maintenance department, and we had a great conversation, and Mr. Mason uh, as well. And, you know, it was very enlightening to hear from them about the operations of maintenance. I believe as you consider the contracting, uh, it would deserve consideration, but I think, you know, you don't always save a lot of money. Uh, I would be concerned, because what I heard at the County Commission and Board Joint Meeting the other day, I'd be very concerned about handing that off to uh, the county, and I would say that to any county commissioner. Um, because if you've got a building uh, where the air conditioning has gone down, you, you don't need to be competing with other entities. You need to get your people in that building and fix the problem. And I think when you get into contracting, the uh, availability of those doing that uh, would concern me. I, I do think there would be situations that I know you already do contract some work um, and I, I have learned more about the mowing piece uh, um, so and, and I know there was offers and suggestions the other night to our board about ways to save money there but I agree with what Mr. Hooper said you know, the people that you've got that are there with you, they're your people and they're there to serve these kids and in the meantime serve the teachers. So uh, while I wouldn't discount that, I would have to be convinced that that is a better way to do business than what we're doing right now. Thank you. Well, I have lived through contracting your custodial services. In Legacy Shelby County Schools, we ran into a budget crunch and we did contract out our uh, custodial services and it has literally never been the way it was. When you actually have custodians that are part of your family and a part of your school district culture, they take pride in that building. They take pride in those particular students and they go the extra mile just like the principal or the teacher or the paraprofessional or the bus driver does. So I am not for given my experience with contracting out those services, I'm not for contracting out that work. Uh, we did the same thing when the merger happened. We elected to go into a contracting situation again, and we were even larger, and it has been an even larger sort of epic failure. No one thinks that the grounds have been kept up. Nobody thinks the buildings are kept up. Nobody thinks even the pest control is being done the way it was done previously before when we had people who were there in those buildings. Um, something that you never think about using contracting services, each of these buildings probably has 40 or 50 fire extinguishers, a, a building this particular size. When you start contracting, they only come to check those fire extinguishers when your contract is ready. So something you get into is you've got to negotiate the contract, it's got to go through an RFP, you've got to hire someone and they've got to come out. All the while you're putting students and faculty and families into a building where you're not checking those particular smoke de detectors or fire alarm extinguishers. And so those are things that you have to be very careful when you start to throw around. We'll just contract that service out and it will be cheaper. I think you need to uh, proceed with contracts with a lot of caution. I think you need to make sure you've got everything in your contract so when there is failure to perform that particular duty, you can hold those people who are contracting accountable. And if they are not accountable, you've got to be willing to say, okay, what are we going to do as far as making sure they're taken care of and doing what they've said? And so for that reason, contracts are not something to be taken lightly. They should be avoided uh, at all costs, especially when it comes to day-to-day -day routine things like our grounds and our maintenance. Another thing you have to be careful with the contracts, I understand there have been some air conditioning replacements. 
and I know we've bid those out and we've con used contractors, but we've used uh, obsolete air conditioning units. I understand that we use things that are no longer. So now we're having problems with them running. We're having problems getting the part to repair and maintain those. And so that's sort of a pushback against maybe using contracts and making sure if you do or if you elect to use contracts that you're doing your due diligence in working through the information in that contract. Priscilla Gregory. Priscilla, she's coming. <clears throat> will jobs that offer opportunity for advancement for our teachers, will they be posted or appointed? Ms. Gregory, I appreciate you asking that question. Here's how I would do business. Um, it was expressed to me that we have a, a lagging talent pool in, um, in, lieu, uh, in, in preparation for uh, administrative jobs. The way I would do business is if a principal uh, retires, leaves, or whatever, the job will be posted. And when it's posted, then we will interview uh, uh, maybe not everybody that's posted. I hope you end up with 20 wanting an administrative job, but however many is necessary to get a solid pool and interview. It's been my experience, I've, I've set in on lots of interviews for uh, uh, other supervisors, for principals through the years. It's been my experience that uh, when you have a pool, let's say of five applicants, that in that five, you're going to have the one person that gets it. You're going to have a person that surprises you in their ability to articulate and show leadership qualities. You're going to have one that disappoints you in their interview that you might have thought would done better, and then a couple in kind of in between. And I think what that does, it grows your talent pool. Now, if the person um, is in the building, say the assistant principal, I think we have assistant principals to prepare them to be the principal. And when uh, a job comes opening, then I think the interview is needed and the posting to occur. Another advantage in that, let's say there is a pretty heir apparent for the job. It helps that uh, prospective principal formulate their ideals and be able to articulate what they want to do while broadening the pool. And kind of come back to Ezra's question about morale, uh, it's, it, it hurts morale when people think who have a desire for an upward trajectory, it hurts morale to feel like there's a glass ceiling. So I absolutely, it would be my um, uh, practice to when positions come open to advertise in, uh, the, in the administrative capacity. Now, sometimes inside the school building, you may have a transfer inside the school building. That, that's a different matter. But so far as administrative jobs, I, I would uh, post those jobs and interview for placement. Thank you. So I think there should be no appointments. And that means if you are actually uh, in the cafeteria, if you're a principal, uh, I think everyone should go through a fair and transparent process, just like the one I basically described first. There should be a cross-sectional group of people. They should be interviewed. There should be a rubric with the questions and people write their answers down. And I think if people are not uh, recipients of that position, especially if they're employees of the district, I think you should be able to share the information with them so that they improve and get better. Because lots of times when you interview for something, you might not do well at first. But if you never receive appropriate coaching and you had a desire, then you don't get better. You have nobody that reaches out to you. I think it's a sin if you're in a position and you're not training someone to take your place. I also believe that there should be some sort of leadership or administrator's academy for people who are desiring becoming a leader. 
All of us are fading out, we're aging out, and we will need young, vibrant people who need idea, who have strong ideas and leadership qualities. And the way that you help them to grow is you put them in an academy or a leadership class, and then you work with them. You give them scenarios, you give them opportunities to, under your support, learn and grow. And then that way you're always building your bench. You've always got a bench to draw from. And so I think that's the strongest way to make sure that your morale is good and that you're getting a cross-sectional uh, uh, avenue of teachers and employees is through that transparency. I have three three part answers to to that question that was that was asked. First of all, in 2004, the current position that I hold was posted. There were about 10 ca candidates that put in for the job of principal of Teleco Plains Elementary. I went through an interview process, not as extreme as this, but I I went through an interview process with a board of central office staff as did all of the other candidates that applied for the job that year. It was very fair, it was very transparent. Mr. Mills, Mr. Mitch Millsaps did an excellent job with that. I suspect I would do that the exact same way as it was done with me. It was very correct in, in the way that he handled that. The second part on building leadership, if you've ever had come to one of my faculty meetings, it is not unusual to see someone from our faculty pool serving a leadership position. I think every one of my 17 teachers on staff this year served a leadership spot for the whole school somewhere. And part of that I, I do in the rubric at the end of the year on the professionalism, it asks you about did you serve a leadership role in something. So I tried to make that opportunity available to all of my teachers and they did an ex excellent job taking that on and it made my job at the end of the year really easy on that professionalism rubric. And thirdly, the final part of that is I think it may have been about five years ago, when all the race to the top money come through, I went through a program called NISL, National Institute for School Leaders. We went two days a month to uh, Lee University. They flew in two specialists, one of them come in, I can't remember the state in New England, and the other one had been the Com Commissioner of Education in Mississippi. And we met with those folks for two days a month for 12 months. It was a very rigorous leadership program that I thought was excellent. So for inspiring leaders, opportunities like that would be a great chance. Edith Miller. Good evening. In my 43 years of service as a public education teacher and growing, I have been under the leadership of several superintendents, beginning with Superintendent Mr. Ellen McDowell to our present superintendent, Mr. Tim Blankenship. I have invested interest in this process. If I, Edith Miller, was presently serving on the board of Monroe County Schools, and had to make a decision for the assignment of our next superintendent, what do you have to offer in this position that's above and beyond as a candidate in this selection that separates you from your contenders and that would convince me to vote for you? Well, I have 32 years of experience in Monroe County. My entire family lives here in Monroe County. My children will continue to live here and teach here and work here. It is incredibly important to me that we continue to grow. That 
of boys that I see leaving the high school that don't really have a plan for that post-secondary. That is extremely important to me that we work on that, that we develop a team that looks at that CTE program and tries to develop a plan for those students. So I would say that one of the biggest things is I have such a strong root in this community and I plan to, once I have finally finished with here, I plan to continue to be a part of Monroe County and the continuing education system. Edith, that's a great question. I actually have a why me page, so uh, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, I would like to think that I have the ability to, to bring the school system together and get us pulling all in the same direction. I have said uh, I don't want to be an us them, I want us to be a we. And, and that's the way I've always tried to operate and have had success doing that. As I consider the three candidates, I think there's a couple of things that to me uh, I, I possess in terms of my experiences, and that is the fact that I've spent so many years in the central office where I've gained um, a whole new perspective in that arena. Uh, you know, the policy committee at work I did for 16, 17 years was very enlightening. I know the board can appreciate that. Uh, being chief negotiator and working with the teachers. Most of y'all um, did not hear, haven't heard this, but I was, I think, the chief negotiator, I think it was 13 years, and we ended up getting um, our contracts. At that time, it was a contract, not a memorandum of understanding, but we got those contracts signed each and every year and with the uh, full su support of the board. Um, being a testing coordinator, I think at the central office level gives me a perspective as I look at the end of course test, as I look at the um, three through eight uh, testing that takes place. I served on a state assessment task force. Um, I was selected down there. I think there was 10 or 12 of us throughout the state. And as we were attempting to uh, go to online testing and back in the missed days, and some of y'all know what I'm talking about there. Uh, so I think that uh, I bring a breadth of experience. Uh, I know there's a lot of talent up here on this stage, but I feel like in a system this size, which McMinn County and Monroe County are very close to the same size, I think that gives me um, uh, an insight into operations. I would then say I'm, I'm a Monroe County guy. I, I think you all got uh, 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 at least one reference letter. and. You know, even when I was in McMinn County, they saw me as a Monroe County guy. And I've raised my kids here, I've done a lot of work with youth, and through all this time, I've been a member of the community. I'm thankful that I was here during my parents. Uh, uh, Deanna had referenced uh, uh, that desire to be close to her dad, so I w was thankful that I was able to be with my mom and dad throughout their adult life until eventually uh, uh, they weren't with us anymore, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful my kids are products of the Monroe County School System, and they're excelling at the next level. I look out here in this audience, and I see a lot of youth that's excelling at the next level. And I, I believe that my breadth of experience is one factor uh, that would uh, separate me from these other two talented people. Thank you. I think uh, currently I am leading a division that is very similar in size and in budget and with lots of the same complexities that are going on here. If you look at the poverty level here in Monroe County, the poverty level mirrors that in the inner city part of Memphis where I currently am working. And so the details that make us be able to perform well I think those particular strategies would be great to bring back here. I think I'm the best of both, both worlds. I'm from Monroe County. I received my foundation in education here. It made me be a strong academic person. It made me be a strong leader. I was able to go away from Monroe County 
and the way that you guys provide support and make it on my own under the things that I had learned and been taught here as a Monroe Countyan. And now I'm coming back because I think I've learned quite a deal, quite quite a bit, that, I, that would help us here. There are lots of different strategies that I think would help us. Something that you said, what makes you different from the other candidates? I actually have a nine-year-old that will be going to fourth grade, and I actually have a freshman in high school. And that's very different from the other candidates. So I've got to make sure I support these teachers and these principals and the people in the buildings because I've got to get it right because I will actually have children attending Monroe County schools. And that separates me from everyone else just in the fact that I've got a big vested interest right there in my home each day to make sure we get it right. J.K. Harrell. This has already been covered. Is that covered? Yeah, uh, whenever, whenever Evans actually was covered by Evans. Do you want to do this one? Really? Okay. Since it's a forum for the candidates. I, uh, the, the first one, I had several questions. The first one was actually covered in the first question here, so that kind of made me feel good that uh, that was already taken care of. Should you be the one selected? Would you agree to be looked at, to be evaluated on the honesty that has that that you have been that you have been judged on in this process? And if it were found that what you have said was not true, would you resign? totally anticipate and I'm not sure what the board's uh, evaluation process something I think the board was very smart in doing the contract here is only for two years so whoever comes in has has to have the ability to come in not do a lot of changes but instead build on the good work that has already been done roll up their sleeves and get started Doing it that way, I totally anticipate that the person that is selected for this job is employed by the board. And so the board, as your employer, is going to set what it is they would have you to do, and you're going to have to be able to check in with them, you're going to have to be accountable to your board, and so you're gonna have to have a very, very good working relationship with your board, and there's got to be lots of checks and balances. So saying, do I anticipate if something comes up not to be true or not to be uh, founded? Absolutely, I think that the board should hold whomever it is accountable, and you very much should resign. If you find that you're being ineffective, and you're not able to lead and get the buy-in, and you're not doing what is best for your children and the faculty and staff here in Monroe County, very much. I think that door swings two ways. I think you want to be elected uh, for this particular position, but I think that you have to have some moral fiber to say, I'm not the person, I'm not the lady for the job, and then bow out gracefully so that someone can take care of these children and families in Monroe County. When I went through the interview process, I treated each one of the questions that I was asked almost like a checklist. So when I answered their questions, I gave them a document that went with each question that was a checklist of what I would do. It's very easy for them at this point to take those five documents and look at that and see well, you know, you said you would do this and this and this and this for a low improving school, and you said you would do this and this and this. 
I absolutely, if I were not doing the things that I outlined to you on how I would handle this job, I would resign, yes. I've answered each question as honestly as I know to answer them and uh, straightforward and transparently. And um, in my circumstance, if the uh, majority of the board felt like uh, I needed to step aside, they would just need to let me know and then I would, uh, I would step aside. So, thank you. Kim Pennington. I could all Hello, um, I am Kim Pennington. I'm a retired teacher from Monroe County. I taught for 32 years. I began in 1980, and I actually lived through this transition of uh, finding a new director and so forth. So it's very important to me that our new director be able to um, hit the ground running, so to speak. So, um, in saying that, uh, how has your experience as a central office supervisor or school administrator uh, prepared you to hit the ground running as our new director? First thing that you're going to have to immediately do when you, you go into the job is to fit, make sure all vacancies have been filled. Before you can start filling those vacancies out there in the school building that I'm talking about, you're gonna to have to meet with your central office staff and make sure that you are developing an amazing team. Now there's one person in our central office right now that is assigned way too many duties. She does an incredible job. I've respected working with her for a very long time, but somehow some of the duties that this person has got to be redistributed among the other, other people a little bit. So that's gotta be put into place first. Then you've got to get all of your openings filled and there are several openings right now. And then one of those openings would be uh, my spot as principal at Teleco Plains elementary so you've got to make sure all of those openings are filled then you've got uh, in-service training that's just right around the corner that normally that there's already plans being put into place for that at this time all of that's on hold it's 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 waiting so that's an immediate like we're a week or so behind on where we should be on getting that in planning then there are lots of things like curriculum that have got to be looked at to make sure that we, we've got teams and a curriculum plan put into place. We have a textbook situation that has got to be looked at very carefully. We may not, it looks like there's not the funds for those textbooks. My group of people at the elementary school had already been looking at a plan of what we could do if those books were not available. And there are ways to do that. That is a cuttable thing. Not that we want to do that, but that is a cuttable thing that could happen and you've got to have a plan put into place for that. But the big thing that I've not mentioned here at all, the person that remains in this spot has a budget that has not been finalized. That is going to consume countless hours working with all of these folks, county commission, all, all the constituents involved in getting that budget put into place. And that is going to be no small task. So there is a whole mix of things that the person taking this on has got to hit the ground running with. That's a good question. and. Uh... I feel like that's where uh, my experience uh, at the central office is advantageous. And the fact, I'm saying some of the same things, but the fact that I've worked in a similar school system 
for 14 years at the central office capacity. I was a, a principal at uh, a career and technical center. I know about articulation agreements and dual credit. Um, I think I can uh, 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 connect quickly with our principals. Uh, I think I can win over the central office staff and I've laid, laid awake a whole lot at night uh, thinking about our countywide end service because I think that will be a critical opportunity to connect to the teachers in terms of expressing what I'm about, what I would do, and then I would actually have to uh, win their heart and souls as they got to know me and saw the decisions. Um, the, the experience in, um, uh, you know, I've dealt with discipline of high school students mostly. Um, I've, uh, I think you have to have some experience there. Uh, been involved with uh, safety and security, and I know that's a big uh, part of people's um, concerns as they look at the school system. I've, I've been on textbook committees for many years, and um, of course, uh, and again, I, I repeat the policy committee. So I think I can establish credibility with these uh, people that I would work alongside and try to lead, and I think that would be very important as we move forward. And due to the fact that I ex have a lot of experience, I see needs and, and ideals and practices that I have gained from being in another system that would help me. I just feel like we've got a couple of schools of thought, the local guys and, and or out of, out of, out of uh, county experience, and I feel like I'm a good blend of both. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a homeboy, but at the same time, I've had an opportunity to work under some great directors of schools and have got some ideals that I think would be advantageous to the Monroe County school system. Thank you. So I actually have served uh, in a, an office of some sort in central office for about 17 years. Uh, this would actually be my third time in coming in to a new division, a new school district, and hitting the ground running. Um, tonight, I think I was able to share with several of you, I have a brochure where I laid out my first 100 days of what I thought should happen and take place. But on that brochure, I talk about what are your four priorities. And four of the priorities have to be to start out, first of all, learning and listening and leading. That's going to be what you get buy-in from. That's what's going to make people say, I can, this is someone I can respect and get behind. And then I, if you see all my four priorities, I said, we've got to get ready to open schools. Putting on a countywide pre-service is a big deal, and it's got to be impactful because that's going to be the tone of your year. For five years, I have put on a division-wide in-service for over a 1,000 employees in Shelby County. And so I imagine that there are some things that are in place that we need to tweak and get busy. One of the things I think, and you are my former teacher, is that you've got to think that you're not gonna just get the ground, hit the ground running the first six weeks or the first eight weeks or the first 10 weeks. You are really going to be running a race to give the best to the people of Monroe County for the next 24 months. And so I wouldn't want anyone to come into this position and say, I've gotta get a great start. I've gotta win people over. And then you just kind of it falls to the wayside. What I think you have to do is you've got to put together your plan of what are you going to do for 24 months. So at the end of 24 months, you're able to show and demonstrate to the teachers and to the board, here are our successes. Here are some things we attempted that we failed at, but we want to go back at them again in a different capacity in a different way. And so I think having done this a couple of times, I've made some mistakes, I've done some, had some wins, I think I could bring those wins to the table to make sure we get started, and I think I can use those losses as things not to replicate in being able to come in and get started on day one. Pat King.
Hello, I'm, my name is Pat King. Um, I have a two-part question. Uh, one is, what tried and true strategy do you have in place that holds principals accountable for hands-on being present interaction on a regular basis with teachers and students? And the second part is, how would you include consistent strategies for multicultural programs? Thank you, Ms. King. I think in this age of accountability, you know, our principals, they, they are very accountable. Uh, they are in their schools every day. They uh, fielding um, numerous phone calls, concerns from teachers, and uh, quite, quite hectic way to earn a living. Um, at the same time, they have to be held accountable for the results of their school. And uh, kind of referencing back in terms of the hiring practices, uh, if, if the principal has an assistant principal opening, my, my process there would be somewhat similar to what we talked about except I feel like the principal needs to be the lead role in terms of hiring the assistant principal. Now, that would come with a lot of consultation with the director of schools, but the principal has to work with the assistant principal on a daily basis. So. I think that's one level of accountability for the principal, and then if the principal is dissatisfied with the assistant principal, then, well, I mean, you hired that person, so how are we going to make it work? Um, so far as the multicultural, I, I think it's very important that we make a, a, a commitment to serving the, the various ethnicities and um, educate our kids to just be kind to each other. Um, to have programs in place that give equal opportunity to all uh, folks in this community because we're all just one big community here in uh, Monroe County. So I thank you. So one of the um, tried and true strategies when you think about holding principals accountable Absolutely everybody thinks of the principals have an evaluation process. And of course you're going to go through the principal evaluation process with those particular leaders of the school. Something that I also uh, would like to see put in place is something called an insight survey. And in the insight survey, faculty members and parents and even students are allowed to respond about the school. What do you think academically is going on? What is your culture and climate like in your school? And not because it needs to be a gotcha. If I don't know what I'm doing wrong, how do I improve? I've got to have data and information to be able to do that. And so it wouldn't be a gotcha, it wouldn't be any retaliation, it would be an opportunity as a leader to be able to take interest in what my community is saying about me. What do my students think? Lots of times we frequently think one thing and then when we get to talking to many, many different people, we find out the problem or the issue or what we could do with something totally different. Another thing that I think is going to be important for the director of schools to do, you're going to have to be in the schools. They will tell you now when I'm running a program, they are going to see me. I have 291 classrooms and sometimes I am in those classrooms three or four times a year. Not because it's punitive, but because I don't know how to support and help if I'm not in those classrooms seeing what the instruction looks like, seeing uh, what are some things that we can improve, talking to people. And one of the things I do with my administrative staff, my directors and managers, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday morning, it is a requirement that we are out at schools. I'm out at schools and my top level administrative staff, they are required to be out at schools. I know that principals frequently have lots of teacher evaluations that they must conduct and they must complete. But one thing that I would say is, frequently you need to be able to walk in a classroom, sit down for 15, 20 minutes, and listen and look and learn about what is going on without you having to script and actually do an evaluation. And so I think that would be another opportunity for administrators to figure out and be present. Something else you said is multicultural programs. How would you address those? 
I think that you go back. I think you go back to the schools. I think you look at the composition of the student body. I think that you look at national holidays. I think you look at your world languages programs. And I think about what are the different activities that we could do as a school. Not a one time it's Black History Month, but what is going on in the world around us and what are our students taking interest in that we can develop a program and buy-in around. And I think that's what you go in and you think about. I think you also have to think about your student body and your teaching staff. Is it reflective of students that are there at that school so that everybody feels like they see themselves there in that academic building? Thank you. In my current position, I try to be at work every morning between 6.30 and 6.45. I don't know how many conversations I have with bus drivers before the day even starts. I don't know how many conversations I have with parents before the day starts because I know they're busy, they're trying to get to work, and that gives them a chance to come in and see me really quick and, and have a word. Every morning I go down to the bus duty room where the kids are and I'm the one leading them out of the gym into those classrooms. I've done that for a very long time. That gives me the opportunity to interact with kids constantly. I make a really strong effort to try to learn every kid in my school's name. It's thousands of kids now and after they pass me it's hard to remember when you're 19, what you looked like at nine, when they come up to me and say, oh, Mr. Hooper, don't you remember? It's really hard, but I've worked hard at trying to remember all those little names and how important every single one of those people are. You rarely will find me in my office in the building that I'm in now because I'm out into those rooms doing different things. Uh, a lot of times I might even just have something that needs to be delivered to all the teachers. Rather than sticking it in the mailbox, I take it around to all of them just to give myself a reason to be in those classrooms and seeing what's going on. Because sometimes on, a, on those evaluations, if they know you're coming, no matter who you are, you can put together a good program. But if you're in there all the time and you're consistently seeing those things that they showed you in those evaluations, you know what, what you've been told is good and true. So I would suspect at the next level, I would continue being out and involved with the different schools as much as I possibly could. From a multi multicultural aspect, Every single child in, the, in your school is important, and I try to work from that standpoint. So you would try to recognize and be compassionate about all the different cult cultures that you have to live with and work with during the school year. Melanie Phillips. First, I'd like to say that um, I know each candidate personally, and I want to say that I admire and respect each one of you for, for putting yourself out there, 
for bringing um, your personal lives into the public forum of this position. Um, I know it's been a very um, stressful time for each of you and your families. Uh, I know the last few weeks have been very stressful for each of you. Um, my question is for Dr. McClendon, and it's not to be controversial, it's not to be um, in any way derogatory in any sort, um, but as you alluded to in the beginning of your introduction, there's been a lot of reports based on your current working condition and your current um, position in Shelby County school system. Um, with lawsuits and uh, administrative leave and things like that. My question, I feel like the community would like to know, is what is your current status with the Shelby County School System? And if you could elaborate what that is and um, what led to that condition. So let me clarify, there's not a lawsuit. Uh, just to go back uh, and be transparent, I think as I was at the board meeting um, the other night and then here at the beginning, we have a process in our school district. And that process is if someone um, writes an anonymous letter or even if they write a letter and they sign their name, uh, because we are such a large district, and one of the things I said the other night at the board meeting is when we buy textbooks, typically smaller districts like this, they might buy a million dollars worth of textbook or $800,000. When we buy textbooks, we buy four or five million dollars worth of textbooks because they're 40,000 children. And so just to protect myself, other employees, when people make allegations, they are investigated. One thing that I can I reiterate, I've not done anything wrong. I am glad that they investigate. As I said, my children uh, actually attend uh, schools there in the Memphis area. And I think anytime you have children there, I think that you have to make sure you're being protective of them. Now, let me say this about the type of leader I am. I'm gonna do what's right. I'm gonna always make the decision, even when it is a tough decision or a hard decision, I'm going to do what is right and I'm going to do what is best for children's and children and family and the majority. That always doesn't make you be popular because there are people that have interest and in having interest, sometimes people get mad. And my understanding is I think there's some anonymous letter writing that goes on here even in Monroe County. And so having said that, I respect the opportunity to come before you guys and say, they have written a letter, there's never been a lawsuit, there is an investigation that is occurring and I'm glad that it occurs and I anticipate just like anything else, the investigation will occur, they'll clear, we'll move on. But I appreciate that I work in a school district where we care about children and teachers and we address people's concerns. Thank you. Melanie, did you have another one? So what they're doing now is they actually have an investigation. There are several parts to an investigation. My particular part I have completed. I am done. That is the end of the part that I am allowed to discuss. I do know there are other parts that are taking place because what happens in an investigation, there's more than one part and there are more than just myself that might be involved in what is happening and taking place. I think if you would go on, there has been a statement made with Channel 10 News uh, I think I read it or heard it before I came in, and I think it gives a very good and very clear explanation, and I think I would like to refer you guys to reading that because I think it'll give you all the details that you maybe are thinking or asking that you want to know. Cynthia? Well, yeah, one more. Good evening. My question is for all three candidates. In lieu of our present financial situation, 
How do you conceptualize a solution that will keep teachers employed, insurance stable, attend to the needs of our students, repair our buildings, and balance the budget? Thank you. Obviously, spending more money than what you have is not possible. We only have X amount of dollars to work with. Now, there might be a possibility that county commission might give us a little more money, and I'm hoping that that, that is on its way, that a little more money can be brought into to the budget. But a little more money is not going to accomplish all of those things that she just said in her question. It's going to have to be a give and take. There's going to have to be a little more money to take care of some things. And there is going to have to be some cuts. Now, as much as I hate it because standards were reviewed and changed in social studies and our social studies materials are so far out of date. But there are other options besides a textbook that are available to teachers. So if that, I think it's $360,000, we could probably make that cut this year. And this year we might could make that work. Next year, no. Next year, because literacy is one of what I consider to be the most important topic, and maybe it's because I work with elementary, I don't know. But next year, that textbook budget is going to be $560,000. And we have to have those new materials in literacy next year. Literacy has changed dramatically. So maybe if we give on the social studies this year, then next year there will be money f for the literacy. Uh, we have got to, I've looked at the budget line by line. I did comparisons on the utility bills on a couple of schools. There were reasons for all the different costs when I saw differences there. But we're going to have to really tighten our belt and make every penny count. The day after we had that conversation about the utilities, I went and met with Philip, and we reset the air conditioning in my gym to where it comes on and goes off at different times. And that's, that's probably like heating four houses or cooling four houses in that gym. So surely that would be some cost savings. Everywhere possible, we've got to look at cost savings. When those kids are pulling those paper towels, one paper towel when they're pumping that soap 50 times. One pump, of, I mean, every little place like that, we can look to save a penny. That's what's going to have to happen. So I guess at this point, I, she asked a lot of good things. How are you going to do all that? And I think none of us thought about when we applied that we would have to be magicians uh, and figure out how to do all that. But I think that you, when you go back and you're looking at the budget, you've got to look at what you have to have. You have to have your instructional staff. There's just nothing. We are about schools. We're about educating children. And so we know that's got to be a protected space. We know that we are able to retain our talent and attract new talent because of the insurance that is in place here. And so we know that those are things, there's been an MOU, so we know that has to stay in our budget. I think at that particular time, you start looking through and prioritizing the rest of the items that are in your budget. You start working with the community, you work with the principals, you work with your board, and you determine what are things that we could either cut from our budget or what could we delay until later in our particular budget. And I think that's how you go through. I think you'd be remiss to stand up here and say what you would do 
because you really don't have a good picture until you get in there and you start tunneling through that budget as to what you could do or what people might be able to negotiate and sort of give up. And so that's why I'm thinking that the best answer is to protect your teachers, make sure that insurance, because it's such a big draw, stays in place, and then I think you begin to look at resources and projects and other things and figure out how to come in and provide and support them in balancing your budget. One of the ideals I would like to incorporate in time is establish a budget committee involved with the, involving the board members and myself as we in a transparent way look at the needs and, and wants of the school system. I would propose we do a needs assessment and try to um, establish what our priorities would be. Um, when you have recurring uh, costs like you have in, in professional salaries and paraprofessional salaries and uh, the insurance, uh, you know what's going to be spent next year. I have ideals about over time um, uh, trying to get our budget in a better position. Uh, I would hope to, through attrition, you know, we, um, as we have positions come open where they're not essential in that time to, to put a hold on there and get this thing in order. I mean, you can't spend more than you bring in. It's a very fundamental problem. Now, looking at this year's budget, I was at the... Uh, uh, the commissioner and the board's meeting the other day and I recognize that textbooks are a sensitive symbolic uh, part of the discussion that's on the table. I would want to look at that. I would want to look at uh, other um, uh, expenditures that are, are taking place in the system. I know that we've referenced earlier the maintenance budget. Uh, I've I've looked at that. I thought Philip Carroll did a remarkable job the other night of explaining all those costs. Um, I think you, you, you will have to look at small ways of saving, whether it's uh, paper towels or soap or whatever, but try every way in the world to try to get things in order. I, again, I do have some ideas over time, but I, I, I like what Dr. McClendon said, you know, a magician uh, may need to waive this one. I would need to get deeper into this particular budget and the process and the priorities of the board, and as we work together, try to present something to the, uh, in a balanced budget to the county commission. I also, though, think uh, open communication and honest communication with your county commission to try to generate additional funding revenue would be part of what we need to do, and I know you've already attempted to do that, but I think that a uh, strong advocate um, for additional funding uh, would be a consideration as well. Thank you. Nancy, this is our last question. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. What is the main goal you have set for your personal growth in the upcoming year? So I think when you think about you coming into a, um, a new and different role or position, and you have uh, a new and different community. A couple of things I think that you have to think about right off the bat is you've got to not only uh, continue to support and grow principals and teachers and others, you've got to continue to support yourself. And one of the things that I think that you've got to do is you've got to attend PD. The state actually gives pretty good PD for superintendents. They have superintendents academies, they have superintendent workshop, they have superintendent training. I think you also have to look outside the state to what are some of the innovative or cut, cutting edge that you're doing. I know one of the things that's going on here at Sequoia High School is they have an interest in STEM. 
And lots of people in the community are very excited about that. Well, you should, if you're going to be the leader of a, not a district of separate schools, but a school district, anything that people are taking an interest of in your school, you need to be accountable of having and gaining lots of content information. And so I think it would, the person who sits in this particular seat, whatever your community and your schools are taking an interest in, you need to become a resource and an expert. Something else that you need to do is you need to begin to have what we call book studies. And so not only do you need to have a book study with your central office staff where you're growing and you're learning together, but you also need to be doing that with your administrators uh, in your building and then suggesting and recommending that they do that with their teachers. Uh, one thing about educators, you have got to continue to be a lifelong learner. Nothing ever stays the same in education. It's the pendulum and it swings one way and it swings back the, the next. And so if you are responsible and you have to make sure you are holding your own self responsible and accountable and making sure you are continuing to grow as a lifelong learner yourself. Um, I think this is our last question, and so I would like to thank the principal here at Sequoia High School for making sure we had a lovely facility and space to have this in this evening. Thank you so much, Ms. Tipton. That would be a three-part answer for me on that one, too. On uh, the 13th of this month, I had scheduled myself to to become a principal evaluator. At this point, I had not been through the training of that, so but I needed to be at the meeting, so I canceled my day of principal evaluator training. So on my professional learning, there are some trainings that I'm immediately gonna to have to get involved in and doing. Secondly, I'm gonna to need to develop a network of area directors that I'm able to talk with so I'm gonna to have to be able to network with some people in our neighboring counties and other places. That would be very important to me that I am able to network. And thirdly, one of the most important things to me, again, is reading instruction. Now I went through a whole series of training last year on literacy in the elementary schools and how that has changed so dramatically. I know in the content areas in high school, you're teaching content, but somehow reading strategies have got to be integrated into that because at the same time you're teaching those courses, you're improving reading strategies and you're improving ACT test scores. So as part of my professional growth also, I would like to learn about and work with folks on how we improve that reading instruction in the content areas in the high schools. Um, it was personal goals, right? Okay. Um, but I like uh, uh, Mr. Hooper. I, I, I'll have to have some renewal on things in terms of my own uh, memory and uh, the uh, uh, certification for, for evaluation of principles. Um, so that that is needed. I think my personal goal in terms of um, dealing with the school system is you know, the big one for me is to earn, earn the uh, employee's trust. Um, I will need to um, dig real deep into the data that exists here uh, uh, in Monroe County and, and get intimately aware of uh, the district level data as well as the school level data. Uh, I would want to work with uh, our leadership and ev uh, establish uh, strong uh, staff development uh, opportunities for our teachers. Uh, Dr. McLennan referenced uh, a leadership academy. I, I would uh, uh, be promoting a, we, uh, an aspiring administrators academy which would allow folks an opportunity to uh, delve into those areas to po be potential administrator um, uh, administrators in Monroe County. And, uh, and, and I like this lifelong learner thing. Um, you know, we never quit learning. Uh, if, if we do, we cease to grow. And uh, that, that was one of the reasons that I pursued uh, my doctorate many years ago. And 
was I, 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 I believe in lifelong learning. I, I wanted to model it as a professional, and it was just a personal goal, and I was glad I was able to achieve that before my mother passed away. So uh, just uh, that pretty much sums up the things I'd like to do better. Um, I would also like to thank everyone that's come tonight. Each of you are very concerned about the future of Monroe County education, and I just want to thank you for coming, and thank you.